Hey everybody and good Thursday evening to you. It's weather for weather geeks. You know, we go stretches of time, especially late summer, early fall. Uh, we go stretches where there's just not much to talk about in the weather uh, department. And, you know, we kind of balance that out with patterns like we're in right now in the heart of winter. We are in the middle of a... Uh, a very active pattern with lots and lots to talk about. We'll get to all that, of course, in this video. I just wanted to make note, I, I shared this on social media this morning, uh, you know, we had a very cold January here locally, and actually it was cold in most of the lower 48 states, but this map shows the temperature departures from average globally in January, and you can see that actually the United States really stuck, uh, stuck, uh, stood out, um, I should say, uh, as far as the cold spot across most of the globe compared to the average in January. Canada was warm. Alaska was warm. We're talking about the continental uh, United States, the lower 48, in other words. Uh, Europe and Asia, very warm. And overall, it was the warmest January on record globally. So just, of course, because it was cold locally and because we had ice cover on Lake Erie and our lakes froze over here locally, that does not mean that climate change and, and global warming is not a thing. It's still very much a thing, and the data certainly bears that out as uh, the world experienced the warmest. January on record, I believe it beats last January, January of 24. All right, I, I also so showed this, I shared this on social media this afternoon in case you missed it. Um, this is the 15-year anniversary of the storm that became known as Snowmageddon along the East Coast, especially around Washington, D.C. 15 years ago, January, or, uh, February 6, 2010, um, a huge winter storm for Baltimore, D.C., Philadelphia, and this was a pretty big storm for our area as well. You get into some of these pinks here, and that's, you know, a foot plus. It was pretty common to see a foot plus south of Route 224 with this storm. Amounts a little bit lower, but still significant north of there. And yeah, we saw, you know, upwards of a foot and a half or so once you get down towards uh, Wheeling and Steubenville, and uh, the Pittsburgh area did very well as well. And that was in the middle of a uh, kind of a, a snow a relentless snowy pattern in the month of February in 2010. That was a very, very active month in terms of snowfall here locally and across a lot of the eastern United States. Uh, we have not uh, seen a snow blitz that lasted quite that long ever since. We've had our you know share of snow and we've had some snowy periods, but February of 2010 is the last time that we had just a you know a really really gargantuan amount of snow for a monthly total. We totaled 36 inches for the month at the Youngstown Warren Regional Airport, and you know that's about half of what we expect in a typical season at the Youngstown Warren Airport. All right, back here in the well here and now, or more specifically last night, it was not snow, but it was freezing rain and a lot of lightning. I showed the lightning last evening. Um, there was some lightning in Western Ohio, but this lightning continued to blossom coming across. The Buckeye State and into West Virginia and Pennsylvania as well. It's pretty unusual to have this much lightning with freezing rain. It's pretty unusual to have any lightning with freezing rain, but this much lightning, uh, that was quite a quite a surprise last night. And, you know, I got some comments today on social media how loud the uh, thunder was last night, and there's a, a good reason for that. You know, it's all about an atmospheric inversion. Usually, when you go up in height through the atmosphere, the air gets cooler. But, of course, an atmospheric inversion oftentimes set up, uh, sets up, I should say, during the nighttime hours like we had last night. And that's where, as you go up through the atmosphere, the air actually gets warmer. And that actually creates kind of a lid on the atmosphere. So thunder and other sound waves kind of bounce around under that inversion and can't escape through the inversion back out into the high atmosphere and into outer space. So that makes the thunder louder a lot of times. Um, th this process, what we call atmospheric ducting, it's also the reason... You know I, know, I know a lot of people don't listen to AM radio these days, um, but, uh, you know, an AM radio uh, signal is greatly influenced by a nighttime inversion. If you've ever played around with AM radio after dark, you can a lot of times pick up some radio stations from really far away places. Toronto, Boston, New York City, places like that, Chicago. Um, and that's because radio waves can travel farther distances and can't escape out into space when you have an, an atmospheric inversion setting up. And that's something we see oftentimes, no matter the season, um, during the overnight hours. So that was the reason why the thunder was so loud last night. And, you know, the freezing rain went pretty much as expected. Now, you know, the radar estimates here of the amount of freezing rain, some of these numbers are a little bit inflated, I think. You know, we're, we're picking up on some 0.3s and 0.4s when I query some of this radar estimated data. I think that's a little high. But I do think it was pretty common for a lot of us to see about a tenth to two tenths of an inch worth of ice last night. You know, my trip home last night was fine until I got down into Columbiana County, and I had to crank up the, uh, 
you know, defroster on my windshield because I was starting to get a glaze of ice on my windshield. I didn't slip or slide or anything, but it was pouring rain in 29 degrees pretty much my whole way home last evening. Derek Steyer lives up in Trumbull County, and after the 11 o'clock news last night up there, the amounts or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the degree in which the rain was impacting the roads and visibility and trying to you know accumulate on your windshield was quite a bit less. The rain was not falling as hard at that point in our northern viewing area as it was in our southern viewing area at about 11.30 last night. All right, all that is long gone. We're left with just clouds for the daylight hours today, and these clouds are still around as of 7.15 p.m., but they're getting set to clear out as we go through the next several hours. All right, let's uh, fast forward through Friday pretty quickly because there's not much to talk about. A partly sunny day on Friday. The next weather intrigue happens late in the day on Saturday. Now, most of the daylight hours on Saturday should be just fine. It's the evening hours. We're going to stop the clock here a little after sunset. Now, this particular run of this model I think has snow a little too far to the south. I think the, the purples and pinks and the mixed precipitation should be a little farther north on the model depiction here, but I think the timing of this is reasonable and that we'll probably see some precipitation breaking out again around sunset, give or take, and then it really gets going as we go uh, past dark and into the rest of the evening hours. This is a pretty quick hitter though, so the precipitation is going to taper off and end you know, around about midnight or so. So the timing is different than last night, but the impacts could be kind of similar. I'll, I'll break that down in a little more detail in just a second, but uh, by Sunday we're just back to clouds and kind of a day like today, colder than today, uh, and there might be a flurry around in the uh, morning hours. I drew this map today showing what I kind of think is the dominant precipit precipitation type or types Saturday evening. I think this is largely freezing rain south of Interstate 80. Once you get up towards 224 and especially up to about I-80, there can be a real potpourri. There can be times when it's snowing. There can be times in which we have sleet. Freezing rain might win out um, in this area at times. Once you get far enough to the north, up towards Mesopotamia, the Route 87 corridor, heading across towards Greenville and northwestern Mercer, Sandy Lake and northeastern Mercer, that zone, you know, I'm less concerned about icing problems up there. And I think you've got a chance maybe of seeing some snow and sleet accumulations instead of ice up there, and that's actually better. That's good news, um, rather than uh, the buildup of ice that may occur, especially in our southern viewing area. Now, you go far enough to the south, and this may be more just plain rain than anything once you're down towards Interstate 70, down towards Wheeling and over into the Pittsburgh area. In the meantime, uh, our current computer models look like this as far as ice accretion. Again, we had about a tenth to two tenths last night. Right now, the GFS model is advertising about a tenth. Uh, the European, which yesterday was predicting a lot, uh, has again reduced its expectations. The NAM and the graph are basically showing nothing. That's because especially the graph has more snow than mixed precipitation. You're going to see that also on this graphic showing the snow spread on the uh, computer modeling. This kind of blue line is the graph model. That's what I showed you graphically on the map a second ago. That's the graph. and taken literally, it gives us, you know, the Youngstown Warren Airport in kind of the middle of our viewing area about three inches worth of snow, but I, I do again, I think it has the snow a little too far to the uh, south. Other models here, like the GFS Ensemble, have up to a couple of inches of snow and sleet. A lot of the modeling is down here an inch or less, uh, and that's kind of where I you know, land as far as my expectations for Saturday evening. I think there's going to be a potpourri. I think some places are going to try to get a slushy inch of snow and sleet, probably favoring Interstate 80 and north. The farther south you go, I can see where there's a tenth or two tenths of an inch worth of ice and some problems as a result for a handful of hours Saturday evening. And this is just the first of you know, a few systems we're going to be keeping track of over the next week. The next one is early next week, and we're starting to hone in a little bit more on the timing of potential snow. It's you know Tuesday, mostly afternoon into Tuesday night. There might be a little bit of a lull for a time Wednesday before snow and maybe some mixed precipitation tries to return as we go towards uh, Wednesday night and Thursday. I'll just real quickly here show you one model depiction of next week. This is the European Ensemble. This is a Monday, quiet day, mostly sunny for the afternoon, but then the clouds return Monday night. And, you know, this model taken literally, and I think this is probably about the right idea at this point. This is, I don't have a, an argument with this. Taken literally, it would suggest the higher precipitation totals are kind of in a zone like this. More of a grazing for us, but perhaps still impactful for a time. Um, Tuesday afternoon into Tuesday night. I don't, I don't have any reason to argue with that. And you know that same suite of modeling, the odds of three inches or more worth of snow. Uh, again, this would be mostly Tuesday, Tuesday night. Again, the odds much higher, kind of in this corridor through here, over towards State College, Altoona, 
Philadelphia, New York City, some big cities probably get a pretty good hit out of this. For us, I don't think that odds are all that favorable for any sort of big hit for Tuesday afternoon into Tuesday night. This is the GFS ensemble showing even lower odds of an inch or more, or three inches or more, I should say, worth of snow. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday night. So I do think that snow is becoming increasingly likely at that time, but a big storm, I you know, I think odds do not favor that at this point. And then another, you know, low pressure system is probably going to track our way at some point Wednesday night into Thursday, some somewhere in that vicinity. And that one, some of the modeling would indicate may drag enough warm enough air, uh, enough warm air north, I should say, um, that uh, there may be something other than just plain old snow with that. So we'll have a lot to keep track of next week. This is going to be a busy pattern and some of the model data is also looking awfully cold as we go into the kind of the second and third weeks of February. I'm pretty much done with the idea that February is going to end up as a significantly warmer than average month. I thought that idea, you know, held a lot of water a couple weeks ago, but the data is just becoming a little more overwhelming now that, you know, February is going to shape up to be probably, you know, not as cold as January, but on the colder side of average, that's looking more and more likely. So we may make it two out of three months this winter with colder than average temperatures. December was about a degree and a half warmer than the average. That's enough rambling from me on this Thursday evening. Have a great rest of your night, everyone. Friday evening, we'll meet again and we'll talk about the weekend forecast and more model data for next week.